good morning or good evening or good day, depending where you are. We are welcome you again to school for uh, Carter School for Peace and Conflict Resolution. Uh, today we have a session which we very uh, proud of, but also see a lot of possibilities for future future development. We bring together peace building scholars from both Georgia and Ukraine to discuss how we can respond to the war, what can be done in response to ongoing violence in Ukraine. And today we have a wonderful set of people who devote their life to peace building, those who work for their countries and across the region. Why Georgia and Ukraine? Because these countries share so much in common. Both of them are former Soviet Union republics which border Russia. Both of them show strive for democracy. They clearly st stress and shown how their uh, commitment to democracy through revolutions and active uh, civic society. But unfortunately, both of these countries are in this gray zone, in this wild east of democracy, where both Russia and the West were trying to impose their influence, try to uh, move these particular zones into zone of their influence without real commitment and help and in this situation we still watching this moment then european union will accept both georgia and ukraine as a members of european union and this being in between two huge zones of influence also impacted some internal uh, tension within ukraine and within georgia before the wars and we will see today also how war in Ukraine affects in Georgian society now. So at the same time, we also know that both Georgia and Ukraine lost their territories occupied by Russia, including Georgia, including Ossetia and Abkhazia, Crimea, Donetsk and Lugansk areas. At, at the same time, we know how peace builders from both Ukraine and Georgia will work in to unite these territories to, across the border. So in this today, uh, it will be uh, organized and facilitated. Um, I'm Karina Karastelina, uh, originally from Ukraine myself, and done a lot of work in Ukraine recently. <laughs> Actually, we still have pre ongoing project in Ukraine, which is now on pause. And uh, I'm professor for conflict analysis and resolution. And my co-facilitator, Nadia, please introduce yourself. By the way, we will ask all participants to introduce themselves because what we found in the, from previous event in recording, we'll only see one person. So we could not put the introduction on the face. So we will ask uh, you introduce yourself. Yeah, of course. Thank you, Karina. Thank you, first of all, uh, for suggesting uh, this joint event that we could organize and invite colleagues from Georgia to speak alongside with uh, colleagues from uh, Ukraine. And um, I am a PhD student at Carter School, uh, and I'm also working on the issues of uh, peace building, conflict resolution, conflict transformation, and uh, I'm working mainly in the context of Georgia, Georgian Abkhaz, Georgian South Ossetian uh, local dynamics. Uh, Karina spoke briefly why we decided to put this uh, event uh, together and I will add up several uh, additional points. Since the 20, 21st of February, basically Russian invasion of Ukraine, more and more people spoke about uh, or remembered 2008 and sometimes they name it as Russia's playbook of Georgia. So named uh, the, the events that, that took place in 2008 and in 2014 as well in Ukraine and what could have been uh, done differently and if it it was possible to avoid the, the, this war that we see uh, unfolding um, in Ukraine. Uh, so um, Georgia experienced the war in 2008, and this war uh, le actually left uh, hundreds of people dead, not only from Georgian side, but from South Ossetian uh, side as well, and thousands of people displaced. And uh, as, as Karina said, uh, Russia has an effective control of two Georgia's regions, Abkhazia and South Ossetia, but the local dynamics is quite different uh, on this 
regions, like the way they are, they respond to the, the Russian uh, politics on the ground. Uh, and I know uh, Olesia and Katie will um, speak up more about this, but what we see actually, uh, especially since 2008, we see this uncertainty and the protracted conflict that affects everyone, people on the Georgia's controlled territory, people living in breakaway regions, especially people living close to the conflict divides. And that happens mainly because of the so-called borderization. Um, because of that, many people uh, are getting kidnapped, imprisoned, even uh, even killed. So the, as Karina said, uh, both Georgia and Ukraine are affected um, uh, by Russia's uh, politics. Uh, and political interests in, in both uh, countries. And we, we think that the experience Georgia had because of 2008 uh, and the current um, processes in Ukraine that also affects uh, Georgia, especially in the context of its breakaway regions. So I'm very much looking forward to our conversation. I wanted to introduce uh, our, our Georgian colleagues, but yeah, as Karina said, no, it's better if you, if you do this. So. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, also just got <clears throat> text from uh, uh, Olga, one of our participants. She is still uh, working on uh, some issue with local administration because she is replaced the same as Tatiana. So she will be joining us, she told, within 20, 30 minutes, as soon as she um, will be able to, to come home. And uh, so let's, let's start with um, a Ukrainian uh, Tatiana. If you can briefly present yourself, especially show uh, your uh, work on peace building efforts, because you're one of the leading peace builders in Ukraine and director of the peace talk and uh, peace land. And also uh, maybe in, in very short, if you can tell what, uh, where you are now, and I know that you're in Germany, but for people, if you can. Yeah, th thank you very much, Karina, for organizing this event. My name is Tatiana. I kindly ask to spell my name Ukrainian way, not Russian way, because that's important for all Ukrainians now. And I'm not director of Peace, Peace Talk. I'm, I'm director of the Mediation and Dialogue Research Center, which is a, a, a research and practice center under uh, Kyiv Mahila Academy. I'm also associate professor at Kyiv Mahila Academy. And in peaceful times, I used to teach peace and conflict studies in many places, uh, including Kyiv Mahila Academy, but also abroad. And uh, I'm researcher slash practitioner. Uh, in my practice work, I was and still is advising to the Ministry of Reintegration of Temporary Occupied Territories on peace building. We uh, launched a national peace building center just before the war. And, and I also coordinate the networks of Ukrainian mediators and dialogue facilitators in uh, all their efforts. And uh, to tell where we are now, uh, it's quite obvious that uh, our life is broken between 24th, uh, before 24th of February this year and after. We are in 25th day of the war. Our people are dying in uh, um, enormous um, uh, quantities, civilians, uh, thousands of civilians are dying and the way how peace building is turned now, we are in emergency response stage. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Nadia, would you? Yes, uh, Olesia, please. Uh, and then Katie will also introduce herself. My name is Alessia Vartanian, and I'm uh, a senior analyst with the International Crisis Group in the South Caucasus. I'm connecting from Tbilisi, Georgia. Georgia is uh, my home country where I have lived for more than half of my life. Um, and most of this time I have been working on the conflicts, first as a journalist and now um, as a research an analyst. 
um, in my life, I mean, I was given a privilege, which was not just a, not really a privilege of having a chance to travel to Sawa City and spending there two months uh, uh, during the 2008 war. And that was a devastating experience, I should say. And now when watching what's happening in Ukraine, um, all these memories come back and uh, it's really very difficult to hear what, for example, Tatiana was just saying about um, civilian casualties and how the life gets split in two. And um, this all resembles very much with what we had to go through in 2008. Belisi is now very much um, is in with two colors, uh, yellow and blue. People are having flags uh, uh, in from, and you can see them from their windows. I can see them from my, my apartment as well. My neighbors are doing exactly the same. You can see them in the cafes. You can see uh, enormous solidarity in the society. People are donating blood. They are collecting humanitarian aid. You can see how much people want to do in support of those who are going through something that they went uh, through a similar thing in 2008. Um, in the, unfortunately, we have been having um, much more radicalization taking place in the society uh, in terms of we have been having some political problems uh, domestically between our um, ruling party and the opposition, which found these reflections in the society as well. And unfortunately, this very crisis has become another very strong catalyst of this kind of division. Um, and I, I, I think this is a really very wrong time for the society to get apart uh, because we, unfortunately, we all are expecting what, uh, what will be next, who will be next, how this whole thing will be developing, including in the South Caucasus. Um, and yeah, while watching what's happening in Ukraine, Georgia has to think about its own problems. Just uh, 30 minutes from Belize, we have um, Russian military bases. And uh, the line um, that is separating the Brekwa region of Sawa City, which is very central. I mean, you can really feel it you know, when you drive along uh, to different parts of the country. Um, it uh, it's, has been getting more and more fortified, fortified in the uh, recent years. And, uh, and unfortunately, despite many attempts to raise attention to that, we haven't seen much of the response. So, I mean, on the one hand, we show our solidarity, but on the other, we are also concerned about our immediate future, what will be happening next um, while the war is still continuing in Ukraine. Thank, Thank you, Alexia, very much for also adding some reflections from, from your side. Uh, Katie, please, you could also introduce yourself. Warm greetings to everybody. I hope that uh, my voice is shared well. Um, my name is Katie Chumbadze. Uh, currently, I'm Georgia's uh, Envoy Extraordinary and uh, Plain Potentiary to, uh, at the Embassy and Mission of Georgia to the European uh, Union. Currently, I work uh, for um, uh, the EU. European Union related topics, um, by relations between Georgia and uh, European Union, its integrations uh, processes, and also uh, the conflict related uh, parts as well, because the European Union is a key mediator in uh, cessation of fire between Georgia and Russia since 2008, and also the uh, facilitator in the only negotiation for format, which is currently suspended, uh, of course. Uh, previously, I served as deputy political director at the MFA of Georgia uh, for seven years, working on Russia-Georgia conflict-related uh, topics, uh, occupied territories, and uh, has been engaged in Geneva international discussions. Um, so, before going to the topics and also uh, giving the floor uh, back to you, I just wanted to use this occasion and once again express uh, my full solidarity and support to Ukraine. Uh, and I tried to keep the colors actually for, for this uh, event, also the colors of the Ukrainian flag. And here in Brussels, uh, at all the meetings, I'm trying to uh, keep these colors uh, on clothes on different um, to uh, wear different kind of symbols of uh, Ukrainian flag. 
in order to uh, make very clear point that Georgia and all of Georgia stands uh, with Ukraine right now and what is happening in Ukraine and the Russian invasion of Ukraine and this unprecedented aggression is also our war, uh, war of Georgia that for us started uh, back in 2008. Thank you very much. So, um, and again, Olga will be joining us as soon as possible because she's still working with the um, government agency in the, in the second, so will be joining us. So uh, the first question is for this particular discussion, we brought together Georgian and uh, Ukrainian uh, conflict resolution and peace builders. So let's, and for us, this particular session is the beginning because we really hope to establish a working group that's why this comparative analysis is extremely important to get into the very roots of particular conflict. And again, as Tatiana told, Tatiana told that it's very important to have the democratic institutions and very important at the same time to have this a response to emergency. Let's also try to see what are the deeper root, how these positions of both Georgia and Ukraine make them vulnerable vulnerable to such particular situation. So I really want to um, ask our participants, how do you see the underlying cause of what happened on why this particular invasion was possible in 21st century? In when we have this multiple international institutions functioning, when we have multiple organization functioning in Georgia and Ukraine, at the same time, how it's happened that it's um, both of the countries were invaded, and how you see the major routes which should be addressed as soon as possible. This is a very, very first question because we really concentrate now on what can be done on concrete resolution. Who would like to start? Tatiana, would you? Okay, uh, yeah. Uh, surely when people ask what can be done, nobody knows all the answers. I, I don't know, no one here, I guess, knows uh, all the answers. Uh, there are certain uh, specific points which I would like to raise here um, with this international audience on behalf of Ukrainian civil society, because we think that um, the way how we see this war is, is different from what you see from outside, which is, which is logical, we are seeing it from, from different angles. And uh, point number one, um, the, there are different narratives of the war. Uh, and the narrative that uh, Corinna suggested is, uh, is a geopolitical narrative, a struggle between two superpowers, uh, so-called West or, or the US and Russia. Uh, the way how Ukrainian civil society and Ukrainian society as a whole sees this war is different. Uh, this is not the case of young post-Soviet democracies of 20 or 30 years old. At least for Ukraine, Georgia might have different narrative, but for, for Ukraine, it's a battle of three, at least 300 years old. This is a long decolonial fight uh, of, of Ukrainian uh, people and for Ukrainian statehood against Russian domination. Ukraine has been oppressed for hundreds of years by Russia in, in all possible way. Um, extermination of population, uh, the um, uh, the extermination of language, culture, statehood, everything, basically. Uh, Ukraine is a country of, uh, which has a history of 1,000 years old. Kyiv Rus initially is a Ukrainian territory, not Russian. Russia has appropriated Ukrainian history as well. 
So we, we've been uh, uh, manipulated and, and discriminated in all possible ways for 300 years. And uh, this current aggression cannot be seen uh, as uh, one of event. It's con uh, it should be seen in its continuity. And uh, invasion, Russian invasion started as such in 2014, not on 24th of February. Uh, but looking even further, if you extend the frame, it, it has started 300 years ago. So for, for Ukrainians, it's, it's a different battle. And uh, there is no choice between Russia and uh, the rest of the world. There is only one choice for Ukraine, uh, the European choice joining the European Union and, and joining NATO. Um, so that's the first point. Uh, the, the second point is that uh, we think that current war is different from war in Georgia or wars in other uh, conflict zones in one particular respect. Uh, which is the mobilization of civil society. The way how Ukrainian civil society mobilized itself in these three weeks is truly unique. Uh, each and single uh, citizen of Ukraine is now fighting against Russian aggression. There are hundreds and thousands of uh, horizontal networks which are working in humanitarian aid, which are working to evacuate people, which are working in nonviolent resistance. And these are networks which, uh, which uh, arose um, spontaneously, but that's, that's the, the, the major strengths of Ukraine. Uh, unfortunately, again, as insiders, we can say that international organizations failed in many respects failed to provide uh, urgent response to what's, uh, what was in principle uh, a, a, a scenario that was foreseen. UN, OEC, uh, EU, all other organizations, uh, they still are not fully working in Ukraine and civil society is taking the major burden of, of, uh, of response. So in this, in this respect, we do believe that um, internationals have to listen to locals. That's the only way how the um, uh, emergency response should be dealt with. Yeah, I will stop at this point. Thank you, Tatiana. You, you really showed very important points, which we actually discussed last time, and uh, the role of volunteering. Because exactly as war started with occupation of Crimea and then annexation of Crimea and then occupation of Lugansk and um, Donetsk, this was mostly <clears throat> volunteers who came to help Ukraine in this moment because army was not extremely ready for it. And this volunteering is really the key for resilience of Ukrainian, Ukrainian people. We, we see it, and this is my, you sharing my frustration as I started with the session, this inability of international institutions to fully engage and help in this situation. And we saw it's in research in even 2014, that a lot of Ukrainians believe that international organizations do not really listen, do not engage with civic society, do not really get strong connection and clues from people who work in Ukraine and understand Ukraine because they had their specific program. And this is very important, I think, part in a step forward to have a deeper dialogue. And I'm really happy that Ketivan is here today and Alessia to also to share this experience, how we work more closely, how we develop this real dialogue with international organizations and giving full agency for Ukrainian civic society and this conversation. Thank you, Tatiana, very much. So I, before we go to our Georgian um, 
the colleagues. Olga, very happy to see you here. I explained that you are in the situation of moving to a completely different country. And um, if, you, if you can introduce yourself, because we um, found that in recording, you only see one face. So it's better than people introduce themselves in this way. Okay, thank you very much. I'm Olga Filipov, Associate Professor of Sociology at uh, School of Sociology, Kharkiv uh, National University named Karazin. And now I am, a, well, I'm trying to find <laughs> title for my uh, current position. Uh, I will work uh, as a uh, visiting researcher at the University of Eastern Finland, uh, so uh, And my main topic of research is uh, political identity, uh, transnational um, uh, connection, uh, social connection, trans transnational social connection, migration, and now it will be more focusing on conflict and uh, analysis and uh, conflict analysis and resolution. Yes. Thank you. So we, I know that you just joined, maybe you need more time to think. Well, the very main question was, and then Titiana start asking, start answering this question about how we see the specific roots which should be addressed of this particular war, what effects on the society which should be addressed immediately right now in the short term, but also in the long term. So if you want to address, if you're ready to speak now, it will be wonderful because we want to hear Ukrainian first. But if you need a few minutes just to uh, settle. Well, I can uh, say in very shortly format what is, from my point of view, what is extremely important for now, it is this green corridor uh, for uh, cities under fire, like Kharkiv and especially like Mariupol. Uh, and uh, firstly, we have to, to, to let people go, go outside of these cities. And here, uh, international actors, uh, have to be involved and also Ukrainian actors uh, should be involved because for instance uh, as, as much as I can judge from uh, all sources which uh, are available for me now at least in Kharkiv uh, city administration work really very tightly in, in very good connection with volunteering organization and Kharkiv and uh, Kharkiv city administration and Kharkiv region oblast administrations they are really in a very good connection with people and uh, with volunteer organization but in mariupol uh, there is some other situation and the people are disinformed they don't uh, receive information and they uh, as they report as uh, we, we can receive this reporting yes because there is a very small um, connection communication with uh, people from mariupol but in case we we can get this uh, communication people um, inform that there is no any information from administration side and uh, so uh, from my point of view, we need this uh, green corridor to let people go outside of the fire uh, uh, from the bombing. Uh, and uh, several actors are, uh, should be involved and are responsible for this, in international uh, actors and also Ukrainian uh, actors. Uh, and as Karina uh, remember, my first message to all my uh, international scholars, uh, colleagues were, please lobby the question about Green Corridor for Kharkiv. It was my first message like uh, on the third or fourth days, uh, day of uh, beginning uh, of the war. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. And one more thing which I really want to address before we move into our Georgian colleagues, one more important issue which uh, Tatiana uh, stressed is imposition of Russian identity on Ukraine. And this is what we see in Mariupol because there are reports, I don't know, I didn't see this complete confirmation about it, but there are multiple reports that uh, Russian uh, uh, occupiers uh, taking people from Mariupol and forcibly moving them into 
uh, Russian territories, claiming that they are Russians, which they are saving. This idea that they are saving Russians from uh, genocide and killing, this is a very big part of Russian propaganda, but also is complete, um, clear, uh, this uh, uh, ascribing of identity to Ukrainian people, complete denial of separate, clear Ukrainian identity. Yes, may mm -hmm. I add a little bit with example. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, uh, this um, attempt to make Russians, yeah, to make Russians uh, among Ukrainian persons is not uh, going only from Russian side. I, I give you example when I send these messages, very short messages to everyone I know, like um, internet, my uh, colleagues, and also to international journalists from different countries. I had interview with this um, journalist during several years and so on. And when I send this very short message that we need green corridor to escape from, from this bombing attacking uh, city Kharkiv, one of the journalists from Switzerland he asked me, would you like to go to Russia? And I, I mm -hmm. sent uh, very big with uh, very big letters, letters, no, 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 no way to Russia. So this understanding where people from Ukraine would go as and Russia as a uh, destination is um, uh, uh, displaced not only from Russia, but on, also from Western uh, countries, particularly from Western journalists. And it should be very clear for everyone, and probably this is one of the tasks we need to, to um, reach, uh, to solve, uh, that we need to share these ideas, that no uh, connection with Russia, and people don't want to go to Russia. And if we are talking about green corridors, it means green corridors to other direction, not to Russia, to Western uh, direction, I mean, to Western Ukraine or to Western, to, to European countries, but not to Russia. And it should be clear for everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is a very important point. Uh, I would like to, because we short time, we can return for this issue because it's very important. Um, Nadia, I, 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 I wanted to actually add the, the question for Georgian colleagues because as Tatiana talked about, there is these two narratives, definitely the, the geopolitical narrative about the West against Russia and also the internal struggles that these countries go through for years and years. So if you could also reflect how this play out in Georgia and also maybe the internet, what the international organizations have been doing and uh, doing since 2008, and especially how this war shaped or I don't know affected the European Union Georgian relationship if it stopped the the aspiration from from Georgian side or slowed it down so any any reflections would be also interesting to hear um oh Katie you uh, opened the mic first at the beginning maybe you could start Thank you. Uh, and I, when I'm listening to um, here during this uh, webinar to our uh, Ukrainian panelists, and also when I see uh, the videos, photos, which are coming from, uh, from Ukraine, that is really so difficult to watch and so difficult to see all, all, all these uh, pictures of the ongoing war and uh, I really do not have any words that can uh, describe the emotions we uh, Georgians have because uh, that is something so much close and familiar to us, despite the fact that uh, the war and the scale of the war, what we are watching now in Ukraine is really unprecedented in Europe, uh, I would say since the Second World War. And uh, so during the Cold War and uh, after the Cold War, we have not seen such massive attacks and uh, aggression of one country against another sovereign country. Uh, and also in terms of its impact on uh, civilians and uh, civil society and uh, ordinary uh, people and uh, the numbers of refugees are uh, really uh, is really huge. 
So uh, with your permission, I just wanted to compare also uh, this ongoing war also uh, with uh, the war uh, in 2008. Uh, as Tatiana mentioned, um, so of course all, uh, all of us have our own history and our own uh, legacy of relations with Russia. We have all uh, our own experiences, but with your, with your permission, I would uh, focus more uh, on the latest uh, uh, years, the latest uh, developments. And I think that uh, uh, Russia, since uh, Russia in the middle of 2000s really became uh, another actor in the region, vis-a-vis -vis to its neighbors, vis-a-vis uh, -vis to the West. And uh, in 2008, what Russia did in uh, terms of uh, invasion of Georgia, it was just testing the ground. And that time, 14 years ago, European politicians were saying uh, those countries who had the experience of uh, Russia's uh, revanchist or imperialist policy, uh, they were saying that uh, today is Georgia, next will be uh, Ukraine, and then our Baltic states will uh, will follow. So that was the, um, uh, so to say, progress of uh, uh, those political leaders who predicted that Russia in 2008 just tested ground for such kind of aggressive steps. And then it followed in uh, Crimea in 2014, Ooh. then in Donbas region, uh, while uh, creating such uh, separatist regimes uh, there and uh, utilizing the hybrid warfare instruments there. What we seen, uh, have seen also in the beginning of 90s in uh, Georgia. So the hybrid uh, uh, intervention, I would say. And But what differs actually the current massive war uh, from 2008 experience first is uh, our Ukrainian colleagues rightly mentioned that is the scale. That is the, um, the really full scale um, invasion and aggression. Uh, and that lasts already um, almost a month. But also in terms of um, international reaction. In 2008, uh, European people and European politicians, unfortunately, uh, uh, the Western countries were uh, perceiving all this as something on the periphery, as something not in the heart of, the, uh, of Europe. But right now, uh, what is happening in Ukraine that really gave the sense of alert uh, to all uh, European politicians, all uh, organizations in the West, because they see the huge, currently they see the huge impact uh, of this war on European security architecture. And finally, the uh, European countries, the Euro European Union and the uh, all collective West understood that, uh, that the practice and the pattern of Russia of using uh, military aggression against the sovereign uh, countries, all this is targeted and aimed at the West uh, itself uh, and per se, and not it, all those wars uh, against Georgia or in 2008 or now in Ukraine, they are not targeted against uh, Ukrainian people themselves or uh, against uh, Georgian people themselves. This is the war uh, um, used by Russia against the West in order to uh, regain its zones of influence in uh, uh, Europe. Uh, and it is not just an interpretation by me, but this is what Mr. Putin, President Putin said uh, before uh, invasion of Ukraine, uh, before uh, recognizing so-called independence of so-called Lugansk and Donetsk uh, regions. He very clearly said that, um, so uh, this was uh, all these steps uh, are aimed at uh, uh, somehow getting so-called security guarantees from the West, uh, 
uh, to get uh, guarantees that NATO will not be enlarged, uh, that uh, the European Union will not be enlarged. And all these uh, aggression are directed to hinder, to undermine uh, the sovereign choice of those independent countries. And this means that uh, the current Russia and Putin's Russia does not recognize um, uh, statehood or sovereignty of its neighbors like Ukraine, like Georgia, like Moldova. And uh, they are uh, using this aggression against the West in order to get influence and in the zones of their um, monopolist dominance. So that is why um, uh, this aggression has direct uh, huge impact on the European security. And I, uh, I'm very glad to see uh, such unity and such understanding now in the West, what was not the case in 2008. And uh, the European, I fully understand that all those measures that have been taken and imposed against Russia are absolutely not enough to destroy the current war machinery of uh, the Kremlin and to stop the war. But uh, today, but uh, they, but those uh, measures are really working. They have their effect, and uh, um, this unity and this firm stance, what we are watching now in the West, I I think that uh, is very much promising. And I think that uh, so from from this war, for, from this unprecedented aggression, all of us will exceed uh, transformed and uh, as different actors because the European Union after this crisis will be absolutely a, a different actor uh, in terms of consolidation of its um, foreign and security policy. And I truly believe that uh, all uh, our countries like U Georgia, Moldova, Ukraine will be different while uh, after exiting this war and, uh, and of course uh, after winning and uh, getting out uh, with victory from this uh, war. Thank you, thank you. Um, Olesia, if you could also add up. Yeah, I will, um, I will try to add. And while listening to what our Ukrainian colleagues were saying, and also what Katie was just uh, mentioning about 2008, I cannot, just um, not to mention um, that always kind of, you know, narratives about uh, um, what, what is happening and how it's happening. Uh, it, it has been changing this 13 years since the war. Um, and I am afraid that we are to see with kind of, you know, change to continue because based on kind of on uh, political realities or on the necessities or the realities on the ground, uh, uh, the attitudes, they have been changing. And um, like, for example, in 2008, uh, uh, during the very war, I mean, during the, when with five days of fighting were taking place, uh, at that particular moment, the Russian media has been constantly saying that there was a genocide that took place in South Ossetia. After that, you could hear that there was, was a Georgian side that attacked the Russian peacekeepers. Uh, later on, we could hear about the uh, Kosovo and that Putin had to respond somehow, or Russia had to respond somehow to, uh, to the West recognition of Kosovo. Later on, it was the response to the NATO and after that to the EU. So it's, uh, it's kind of an endless um, search for the justification of what is, should be condemned and should not be happening per se. Um, I think what is really very important, uh, while we are all should stay aware of with attempts and always kind of geopolitical games, especially during these turbulent times when we do not fully understand how many things uh, can start unfolding. I think with this, there are two things that I would probably um, share from my very side. Um, of course, uh, every family is happy the same way and unhappy its own way. Uh, we all have uh, our own kind of backgrounds. Before 2008, there were um, more than 50 years of, uh, of some tensions or conflicts or misunderstandings that were taking place between um, two breakaway regions and, and the rest of Georgia. Um, that does not necessarily mean that with uh, conflicts were to unfold in something that we saw in 2008. 
but why I think it's really very uh, important for sometimes for us to stay honest with ourselves is because this helps us to address with very core problems that are getting uh, employed by the external actors in their own goals sometimes, not necessarily uh, the positive ones. Um, what the Georgian government did after 2008 war is, uh, in a way, it put aside the conflict and separated it in a way from the policies and started making attempts to reach out to those who are in the breakaways. Um, and I think this was a very important uh, message to those who live on the other side, because while they were going through their own uh, traumas and uh, their own memories of what happened decades ago or in 2008, um, for them it was really very important to be recognized as people who live there and who can be accepted. It's very important to keep the door open. I understand that it is kind of probably uh, a very difficult uh, thing to, to even consider in the very current context of Ukraine with enormous brutality, unimaginable brutality that is taking place. I mean, watching videos from Mariupol is, is just traumatic for any normal person. But on the other hand, we are to, um, to continue living together and, uh, and uh, finding appropriate ways how to um, recover from something that was imposed on us through the policies that can find the reflections and in a way bring in the people who might not be necessarily exactly the same as we are and especially during these difficult times when separation happens much easier you know we are kind of very angry we're aggressive to others um, I think it's really very important to somehow start thinking in that way um, in, in a way, we are much stronger when we are united and uh, and finding the ways how to unite uh, around uh, uh, around the cause, which is humanistic, which is broad enough for us to to come together. I think it's really very important. And the other thing that I wanted to say, and I'm sorry if it, it takes a, a bit too long, but this is kind of something that I really kind of, you know, um, uh, would want to say. Um, look, I mean, our international system and our international organizations, they certainly kind of, you know, they are failing here and there, and we have seen it many times. And not just uh, during the conflicts, but in kind of uh, relatively peaceful times as well. And we certainly would want them to be better. We want to, would want them to function better. Um, and... Um, this is just the reality that we have after the Second World War, that uh, the key institutions, they are consensus-based, um, oriented, you know, and in, in very often they are, not, they are not just constructed in the way to respond to such a huge crisis like, for example, the Ukraine war. Um, while we all can be um, unhappy about the way they are handling or their inability to completely prevent or resolve all the conflicts, I think it's really very important to still give them a space and to recognize their presence and also um, their involvement. They are the ones who are, in a way, air airbag, you know, when we are having a car crash. They are the ones that are sharing norms with us. They are the ones that are, can also provide us a platform that we will still need to continue talking to each other. They are also the ones who can bring in uh, the humanitarian aid and support that we need so much um, uh, after the wars. Um, by pushing out or kind of, you know, in a way falling in, in a trap of criticizing the international structures and institutions. And this is perfectly, I perfectly understand that. Again, I, I can remember my anger um, in 2008 during the war. But I, I, in a way, we are falling in, into this trap that is very much promoted by those who are now waging the war in Ukraine that there is no one in the world, there is no one that is to take part of us, there is no one that can share the humanistic principles with us, that we are alone. And there is no one uh, that is really kind of, you know, to take care of wh what is happening. Um, I think the international organizations with all their problems and maybe mistakes, uh, they, are, they certainly have the space and uh, they are not there to resolve everything, but it is really very important to uh, recognize their presence and give you know, 
a chance for their involvement, uh, including during this critical time, and hopefully we are to see soon the, the end of this war as well. Thank you. Thank you. I do, Nadia, do you want to do some comments? Um, no, I, do, I, I will not add because both um, all of them actually said it perfectly. And these are actually kind of a reflections that uh, the, the conversations we are having here at Carter School because we are watching not only one conflict, but we are watching many different conflicts around the world and the, the, the questions about the international system and how it functions and exactly the trap that Alessia spoke about that there is like, we are standing on a very fragile moral ground and we are alone, that is very much not helping. And this, this narrative will, be, will not be helpful. And I think, the, I think that this finding stress of strength of solidarity and like standing with Ukraine at this very difficult moment is very much, very much needed and very much important. So thank you very much for bringing up these points. Yeah, this is very important and we stress this engagement in really deep dialogue and accepting Ukraine as an equal partner in this dialogue with international organization. I think this is very important part which we have to stress and work together on. And a lot of you also stress all important immediate needs, green corridors. We also think about immediate need of trauma healing for all people who are in Ukraine because trauma is something which is deepening with every single day and really reduce. I, I, see, yeah, I just wanted to give you an um, opening for it. And we also, I strongly believe that we really need to address peace education because children don't have explanation what actually happening. They, its influence will be influence their relationship with their neighbors, relationship even with everyone, because aggression become normalized in, in their life. So we this is another immediate need. And we'll have a session on in, in, education and emergencies uh, very soon on 11th. And um, another very immediate need, which we see is uh, peace negotiation. And I really want to address, I want to hear you for all of this, but if you can also build, because peace negotiation and peacemaking is something which is extremely controversial right now, extremely controversial. I myself going, should be concessions, what concessions should be there or not at all? What, how are we saving lives on really fighting for? So there are so many issues which I, there are many controversies and dilemmas which are right there. So I would like um, to have this international our scholars from both countries to address these ideas of immediate needs with specific also emphasis on peace negotiation, what should be done or how they can be proceeding. Tatiana? Yeah, yeah I wanted to, to step in uh, to, to do perhaps um, some uh, some emphasis uh, on uh, certain competing uh, norms uh, in uh, in international law and international relations. Surely, peacemaking and peace building uh, uh, these are important roots, and uh, it's it's clear that uh, they they should be. Um, at, uh, at some point, uh, they, they should be activated. But what we as Ukrainians are trying to say, and what my colleague Olga Filipova was trying to say, is that right to protect goes first. Without this right, nothing else will work. Uh, and when I'm hearing, uh, I'm, uh, I'm a mediator. I worked 25 years in mediation. Nobody can accuse me um, not to love dialogue and mediation, but at this moment, when I hear uh, my uh, respected international colleagues suggesting dialogues between Russians and Ukrainians, citizen to citizen dialogues, uh, you are suggesting dialogue between rapist and victim uh, during uh, the, the act of rape while um, the rapist is still raping the victim, you suggest in uh, peace building. Before anything can be done, people should be protected by all possible means, uh, evacuation corridors and protecting the sky. 
we, uh, for some reason, we are not uh, talking here about supply of uh, weapons. But in this specific, specific situation, uh, if these weapons can protect civilians, and we strongly believe they can, they should be supplied. Okay, we, we now are not talking about no-fly zone because for many reasons, this has been uh, deemed uh, very risky by uh, military experts, but there are many other ways to supply uh, arms to Ukrainian uh, army uh, and to protect civilians, to protect our sky. That's, that's the first point. Uh, everything else come, comes next. Uh, and uh, we also, as dialogue facilitators and mediators, we also think that um, uh, for Ukrainian peacemaking, uh, for, for, uh, for, for peacemaking in this war, we cannot rely on classical formats. That's, that's not the case. Uh, we, again, we are dealing here with a huge asymmetry, uh, which is still ongoing. And uh, the, the, we should find perhaps other, other formats when uh, victim is empowered rather than treated uh, on equal basis uh, with, a, with a rapist. That's, yeah, that, 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 these are the feeling of my colleagues, mediators from the ground. Tatiana, I, would, um, I really would like your um, opinion about peace talk, which is going right now. Do you think there is any um, possibility for peace talk? Do you see what can be done to make them successful to finally make ceasefire? Well, the uh, peace talks is, is always a good thing to have, uh, even if it doesn't take us anywhere. And we, uh, we do not see that uh, peace talks at first track at the moment take us anywhere in terms of uh, big resolution of, of the big war. Uh, uh, we hope that there might be some smaller um, agreements like uh, perhaps temporary ceasefires that can allow again for humanitarian corridors to, to evacuate people. Uh, that's all uh, I personally hope. At the moment, uh, we, 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 we still believe uh, that for Ukraine, there is the, the compromise with Russia would cost a lot. If, uh, if Ukraine compromises now, as Georgia did in 2008 and uh, all other countries, we will see uh, a next invasion very soon. And uh, it, it does seem weird uh, to hear this from, from a mediator because we as mediator, we were taught uh, to not to make things white and black. We were always taught uh, to, to find many different colors, to find uh, other solutions, but there are certain situations where you have things black and white. And uh, for Ukraine, the overall objective is ideally the change of Putin regime. That, then it would be the victory in this war. It is, of course, unrealistic at the moment to, um, to, to do it, but uh, it, it, should, it should be taken into account. Um, yeah, uh, there is unfortunately not much hope for the peace talk from my side. No, and Tatiana, just to verify, I don't think, knowing you for many years, I don't think you, you deny the dialogue because we know that it's not Russian people who invaded Ukraine, it was the Russian government, right? So, and what Putin really want to do is impose the border between Russia and Ukraine, social border, so in that it's completely to different people and this is a Nazi in Ukraine and uh, other and uh, people who are uh, suffering from them. So reaching to those who in Russia who against Putin probably will be a next step, but my understanding now you believe that it's not something which Ukrainian, Ukrainian people are ready for right now. 
Uh, I'm just well, trying to yeah, just trying yeah, yeah. to verify. Yeah. I, I I saw Olga uh, was was disagreeing. I I would disagree with this narrative as well. Uh, there is no such division as a bad Putin and good Russians. Please, please do not get into this trap. This is propaganda. Uh, we, we have now uh, opinion polls from, from Russian uh, sociological uh, companies. They say Putin, Putin uh, approval ratings go, go higher, around 70% or so, or, or at least majority of Russians uh, wholeheartedly support the war. Why they do this? That's the other question. Yes, they 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 are uh, zombie people and uh, they are under propaganda, but uh, it, it it doesn't give them excuse for supporting uh, Putin Putin regime. And um, in uh, in these circumstances, uh, trying to to support good Russians uh, that that's a tricky thing. How do you know who is good Russians and who is bad Russian, uh, who supports and how? Uh, that's number one. And if uh, the other thing, I think also methodologically, if, if we want to support people in Russia who will mobilize against Putin regime, that's not about dialogue. That's, that's a different type of uh, activity but it's, it has nothing to do with dialogues, uh, uh, I'm afraid. So uh, that would be rather supporting non-violent resistance to regime. But uh, that's different things methodologically. Thank you very much. I'm really glad that we have this perspective from Ukraine. Olga, yes, please. Yes, I would like to support uh, Tatiana in this issue. I am absolutely um, sure and uh, absolutely agree with Tatiana that we we cannot we, we cannot separate Putin and good Russians, because uh, all these uh, years since at least since two thousand eight, the propaganda created such view among Russian people that it is difficult to convince them uh, what is true. And I had a lot of cases, uh, even with my relatives in, in Russia, even with my colleagues in Russia. And uh, it is difficult to, to uh, give them our uh, explanation, our view, all these years, all these years. And so, I absolutely agree with Tatiana that uh, there is no, in Russian, there is no people who is not, who should not be blamed for this. Because, be, because of the, their silence, because of their neutrality. We are against Putin, but we are, we are neutral. We would like not to be involved in any pol pol politics. This all gives particular result. And now, I have to say that now I'm outside of Ukraine, I'm in Finland, and here there are a lot of uh, people from Russia, and they live in Finland for many years, but they still are under influence of Russia today, Russia ideology, and getting all this uh, democracy value, democratic value of uh, Western countries, they are still support uh, ideas about great Russia and so on and so on. And even people uh, which could be seen as a progressive people at, at a glance, they also think that, okay, uh, Russians just finished this nationalization in, in uh, Ukraine and everything will be fine. They don't believe that this is real war. And uh, from my point of view, what, what should be done? Uh, we should think about how to move, how to push Russia inside from Russia, within Russia, how to bring these ideas to uh, Russian people, what is going on really, and how it is possible to do it. Uh, of course, we can have some communication with our colleagues. For instance, from the first day of war, I sent 
uh, Tatiana probably knows about this initiative from Ukraine, Ukrainian side. Um, come, uh, come back uh, home from Ukraine for Russian soldiers. Uh, these initiatives, when uh, mother or wife uh, from Russia, they can call to Ukraine and ask about uh, their relatives who uh, went to the war. So I send this information to colleagues just step by step to inform them what is going on, that this is not for one or two days. And also, I think that Western countries are also responsible in this way, in this task to do, to, to, to share somehow, I don't know how, somehow share information which should be available for Russians in Russia. Uh, maybe I am naive, but there are in this our uh, informational society, uh, in in a society where there are a lot of different sources of information through internet, through different channels, uh, it should be find some way how to bring this uh, uh, this information uh, outside of Russia propaganda to Russian people, and only after that, only after that when this information uh, will inform the, them what is going on, we can expect some changing, small changing in their perception about Ukraine, about war, and about regime of Putin. And their role. And uh, uh, I, again, just would like to, to underline that maybe, maybe, a month ago, I also think about separately Putin and separately uh, Russian people. But now, I do not think so. This is a one whole which is interlinked and interconnected. Thank you. I'm and really dialogue, glad that we... Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Dialogue, pro, yes, we, we need dialogue. But I'm sorry to say this. This is not time for dialogue now. Uh, before or until we stop shooting and until people will be protected from, uh, people of Ukraine will be protected from this. Thank you very much. And we really have in this deep conversation, which I believe that's why we really need this working group and continue working on it. Um, should, uh, it will be really uh, glad to hear from our Georgian Nadia. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. This this is so interesting to hear because I'm I'm actually wondering from Georgian colleagues to to speak about this immediate and longer term kind of responses. But also when Tatiana and when Olga spoke about this division between Putin and the Russian people, that did not happen in 2008. I'm not sure if the colleagues from Georgia agree or disagree with this, but even until now, um, many many Russians would come to Georgia and they never would experience any kind of like the, the, the problem. So did this, this kind of uniting image or the common image that the Russian politics is not that much rejected by the ordinary Russians, it, I, I don't think it happened in 2008. So it, it really like continued. So right now it's, yeah, some people still um, talk about that there are Russians who oppose this war. And uh, I have this question all, 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 all the time. It's the lack of the information and, and this real propaganda and this range, like brainwashing processes that has been going on for years and years, or it's the actually matter of beliefs, like who you b believe in. Do you think that the, the, the Putin's regime is the, the one that tells ultimate truth or you are actually thinking that there is this alternative information. So I'm rather, um, uh, I'm hearing a lot of, uh, not so contradictory lately, but uh, some different opinions on this. So uh, in this, Alessia, if you, uh, at this time, if you could, um, could be the first and then Katie, Katie would follow. You know, it's a very, uh, very important and very tricky question about uh, how uh, the Russians uh, were responding and what has been going on in, uh, in 2008 and after that. Um, and I don't even know whether I should be responding to that, to be honest, mainly because uh, uh, while hearing uh, what Olga and Tatiana were saying, you know, um, 
Uh, I, I think I agree with them that this is not, uh, this is a very different time, you know, I mean, I'm talking about this from still from the perspective of 13 years have passed, right? And uh, certainly we have uh, fears, risks and all of that, but this is very different from what um, the Ukrainians are going through. I, I, I just probably, and uh, this is uh, maybe one will say that this is not professional at all, but um, it took me at least two years uh, to start talking to some people in Russia, I can tell you. I mean, after 2008. And, uh, and again, I mean, maybe I will also reveal, I was born and I grew up in Russia. My mother, she is from Russia, you know, so it was uh, extremely difficult and painful to, for example, for me to speak to my classmates. Um, because they lived in a completely different reality and they were speaking about the war in South Ossetia the way that was completely not true, <laughs> mainly because I saw it myself. So it's, uh, it was, uh, I found it difficult, but at the same time also what my 15 years of, of working on these conflicts and not just Abkhazia and South Ossetia, but some other context have told me, taught me is that sometimes you just need to, uh, to give a space you know, to people. And I think it's really very important for us to voice uh, some of our concerns and sometimes even blame each other, you know, for things that have been taking place. It's uh, very clear that many people are disillusioned about, about all these attempts to uh, establish peace. So many efforts were made uh, to bring peace to Ukraine and we still see what's happening. And, and the worst is that uh, we all understand that with is a nuclear power, superpower, you know, and where there is very little that can be done to enforce, you know, with responsibility to protect in this particular case. Um, and I can tell you that this is a terrifying message for all the neighbors as well. Uh, at least I'm, I'm kind of, I'm very, very, concerned about what will be happening after that, no matter how the war is, is, uh, uh, is to proceed. Um, if you very, if allow me, just one very small remark. In very, it, I have been traveling recently, and twice I took an airplane from Istanbul, and my airplane uh, was full of ethnic Russians, um, mainly of my age, who were uh, running. They were not uh, flying, they were running from Russia. And, um, and here and there, you know, I was asking uh, some of the people who were sitting next to me or while we were standing in the line and, and they were saying, we don't agree with the war and we don't want to be part of that. Um, I know some, some of the civil society people in Russia, like for example, some people I met uh, just recently and that again, they escaped from Russia because of the war. Um, and they are from the civil society called uh, civil society organization called Memorial, uh, which was at the front line basically, um, and has received all the worst things, you know, from the, the from the Russian leadership. And um, it's uh, it's clear that maybe they are not exactly on the same page, and <laughs> they cannot feel what Olga feels, right? But at the same time, they, I, I think we may need um, to give people a chance uh, and, and not to say that if you're ethnic Russian, that necessarily means that you're, you're with Putin. Um, I, I know that this is really kind of very difficult statement from my side, but I, and I, I'm sorry that I'm making that even. Um, about uh, negotiations. Um, I think uh, with immediate response that has been taking place in Ukraine is very essential and very important. It is, uh, we mentioned here corridors, there are many more issues. Every war, unfortunately, has the same patterns. Missing people need to evacuate civilians, find the ways to collect the data of those who are dying, exchange of the prisoners, detainers, mm, captives. Um, finding the ways to exchange corpses. Um, these are the very uh, important things for those who have to go through this uh, tragedy themselves. And, uh, and I think it is uh, very much the responsibility, not just of the society, but uh, also, but primarily of the state to take care of these issues. And with this, uh, you can say that with this talking to the devil or the rapist, but with this, which is, has to be done in, in favor of those who may need to see and then to 
to have a funeral, you know, of, of their grandmothers or their kids uh, who unfortunately died with war. Um, and I think this is really very important to, and it is important to do that right now. So with this kind of, no matter how we are to proceed with this, uh, with this something that has to be addressed. And, and um, when it comes to the long-term processes, um, in 2008, Georgia uh, had to sign with six-point agreement, and you probably know that Russia argues about a different kind of text, uh, you know, that we signed. Um, I think what uh, gave um, a bit of a hope uh, to those in Georgia is that um, it got a profound support from the European Union and also from, uh, from the United States. And that support came both through the policies and finances and political support to uh, reform the domestics and also, but also in terms of the support uh, to the policies related to the conflicts. And um, certainly Georgia, Georgia is even smaller than Ukraine, <laughs> 11 times less population than, uh, than Ukraine. Uh, but I, in a way that uh, gives you a chance not to disappear with your problem and also to find the way to, um, to mitigate the possibilities of new escalations and incidents that again, again can uh, affect the they do affect the people on the ground and not necessarily only on the Georgian side, but also those who are living in the breakaways. So it's um, very weak from my side uh, and certainly not on our, these are not the receipts altogether, but uh, this is probably what I could contribute. The very final word from my side, I am a big fan of Zelensky and I watched him during the uh, Crimean annexation, and he was probably the only person who was giving me the hope. Uh, and, uh, and I think when he is addressing the Russian public with his fluent Russian, and look, I mean, I remember him from uh, my childhood. He was a star for us. I can definitely associate and listen to what he's saying. I think this is a dialogue that is happening with the Russian society right now. And I would not, uh, and I would give it a chance still. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alessia. I will note that uh, on this, you said everything perfectly, just because we are, I think we have 11 minutes left. So I will give Katie the chance to respond to this second wave of questions. And then Corina will give maybe the for concluding remarks to speakers. Thank you. Please, please, Katie. Uh, yeah. Uh, so actually, uh, when we talk about peace building or peace negotiations and uh, everything what we have learned actually in academia, we also probably need to understand that uh, the peace building in uh, the traditional or classic uh, conflicts or conflicts uh, with with classic understanding. Um, so like um, the crisis, uh, the conflicts in Africa, in the Middle East, um, so in the Latin America or uh, Southeast uh, Asia, where there is the, so to say, the internal, the domestic dimension or civil war or the different uh, paramilitary groups, armed groups, and et cetera. This, that is absolutely different thing. And uh, the conflict, what we are facing in the uh, Eastern partnership space, um, Ukraine, uh, Moldova, uh, Georgia, that is absolutely another type of uh, conflict where we have this kind of hybrid uh, and in, uh, direct uh, intervention and engagement of um, so another sovereign state, uh, which throughout years, for decades, has manipulated, used actually um, conventional and also non-conventional uh, warfare tools, uh, disinformation, propaganda, hybrid tools, in order to manipulate and destabilize the situation, and in order to somehow um, uh, um, so hinder and undermine those countries uh, independent sovereign choice and their aspiration towards the West. And uh, also we have witnessed the practice uh, when uh, Russia in all our countries are, uh, is utilizing the pattern uh, while it is doing everything what, he, what it wants 
uh, achieving the goals through um, invasion, aggression, and etc. And then uh, when it already uh, achieves what it wants, comes to the negotiation table, says that everything what is done, it's already fait accompli, and you just agree on this. And if the negotiation is, uh, um, so to say, uh, led uh, with uh, uh, Moscow, unfortunately, you do not see any, any sign of goodwill to uh, um, negotiate on something uh, in a uh, meaningful manner. Uh, or even to uh, have the obligations fulfilled uh, by Russia. Even not only the verbal agreements, but also the agreements that are undersigned by uh, its um, uh, presidents. So in that situation, it is really very, very difficult to uh, say what is meaningful and what would be, uh, so to say, uh, promising. Uh, while having the exp uh, experience of, participa of participation for seven years in Georgia, Russia, uh, negotiations in Geneva, and having uh, and, uh, the possibility to share with you for, uh, the experience of Georgia, 14 years uh, of uh, experience of Georgia from, from these negotiations, while Russia is, as uh, Olesia said, each and every time when uh, you have in the, nego the negotiations is, uh, are based on the ceasefire agreement and the main agenda point is about particular uh, items, particular provisions of the ceasefire agreement to be fulfilled. And Russia is coming four times in a year and each and every time saying either that the agreement is already fulfilled, but, but when you are starting uh, and giving the particular quote, quotes from the ceasefire agreement and saying that it's not fulfilled, so then it says that, oh, you know, uh, after this agreement, yes, I signed this agreement, but afterwards I recognize right now we have absolutely new realities and uh, this uh, agreement is not valid right now. How you can have uh, real peace negotiation with, with an actor that uh, does not respect uh, any agreement, any obligation, and not only this is by agreement, uh, which is misread right now by the uh, Kremlin, but even very basic uh, basics of international law is um, absolutely undermined and ignored in Ukraine, in, in, in Georgia, and the Kremlin is right now trying to insist on its rules, on its uh, uh, perceptions on its uh, own uh, willingness. And it's, of course, very much difficult in such context uh, to advise on something. But at the same time, I really uh, cannot uh, uh, ignore the importance of the peace negotiations, particularly when it is about uh, very concrete and practical humanitarian needs. And, um, and first and foremost, when it is about um, uh, when it is about uh, reaching out uh, people on the other side of the occupation line in our Georgian context. While uh, in contrast uh, to the Ukrainian case, we have uh, uh, Abkhaz population in, uh, on the other hand of, um, on the other side of the occupation line and also ethnic Ossetian population in uh, Tsrinwali region who right now are absolutely under Russian control, uh, under effective control by Russia that is already recognized by international court. Uh, and, uh, and the people who live uh, uh, fully under Russian, in Russian information field, under um, strong propaganda and disinformation, and they do not have any alternative source of information. And of course, they share the perceptions that are, that are in uh, Russia because of this propaganda machinery. And of course, we Georgians have to continue talking to these people and somehow to uh, decrease uh, Russia's monopolies influence on them because uh, first and foremost, this is our obligation as a, as a state. 
um, just a few words, if I may, uh, about uh, the international uh, dimension of this uh, current uh, aggression and its roots and uh, probably also the solution. I think that uh, uh, when we call uh, the Eastern Partnership uh, space, uh, Georgia, Ukraine, or Moldova as uh, uh, gray zones, or sometimes uh, within the OEC, people call this region uh, or these countries like countries in between. I think that that is also that comes from uh, Russia's, um, so to say, attempts uh, to uh, portray the current affairs in the region uh, through the inertia of the Cold War and through the zones of uh, influence and through uh, the zones that are as if uh, they are under uh, so-called Russia's uh, privileged uh, interest. I think that uh, uh, we uh, have to uh, uh, cease actually uh, treating these countries as something in between and treat these countries as gray zones because these are the countries that have uh, absolutely European identity and uh, aspiration. And what I see right now in Ukraine, the uh, courage and bravery of the government, of the president and the ordinary Ukrainian people, I think that that is so much inspiring uh, to the entire um, uh, world and uh, European leaders themselves are so much inspired while looking at the government and people of Ukraine fighting. Uh, so with hands actually against um, such uh, aggression of Russia. And I think that uh, um, uh, just to conclude on positive notes probably this unprecedented unity what we have seen in uh, the West in European Union right now and what we have not seen in 2008 and uh, since then and I uh, I think that um, so uh, those measures those really unprecedented measures uh, the list of sanctions uh, prohibiting um, visa and master cards uh, or uh, all financial instruments activated, all uh, Western companies uh, leaving uh, Russia and uh, stopping and ceasing all, uh, suspending all uh, ties uh, with uh, Russia. I think that this will have its impact uh, in the long run uh, period, of course, and it will uh, have its impact on, um, on the trajectory of uh, the ongoing war as well. So, and that gives me the hope uh, that uh, in the end, uh, the entire West together with Ukraine, Georgia and Moldova, uh, so will exit from this aggression. Um, so uh, much more uh, str stronger actually than we were uh, in the beginning. And I think that uh, right now it is really the time to be strategic and to take strategic stance. And uh, I think that there is still the room uh, for, for the West and for the European Union to take even bolder decision, decisions. And here, I really uh, think that uh, this strategic de decision and the uh, uh, right response uh, to Russia will be uh, granting the uh, EU member uh, candidacy for the um, candidacy status for the uh, EU membership, granting the status to Ukraine, to Moldova and uh, Georgia. That will be the right answer to Russia because this is what Russia is trying to uh, undermine. The European choice of those countries and the independent and sovereign foreign policy choice. And that, that needs to be done. That would be strategic from, uh, from the Western side. Thank you very much. I think this is the, first of all, I really want to appreciate your time, everyone, and Nadia, thank you for organizing and helping. I think this session is extremely important. It's very hard to underestimate its importance because it's really helping people who hear in uh, from United States and also our colleagues from other countries to understand the really deep underlying causations and effects on society this given voices and given opportunity to understand real dynamics what's going on 
And also this, I think, session really help, help us to understand the importance of such dialogue between Georgian, Ukrainian and Moldovan colleagues. Because this comp compar comparative analysis or this analysis showing these three countries, which many, exactly as um, Katie Van put it very, very strongly, in many, even here in the United States, among the best peace builders, there is still this idea that why not to give Russia this security and, and give Ukraine to Russian influence? And this is something that undermine position, choice, which all Ukrainians already made. We had this great session last week, Olga was part of it, showing how Ukraine have this, even come together even stronger with this very specific, different Ukrainian liberal democratic identity and acknowledging and giving its agency, it's very, very important part. And also it's give us a session opportunity to underline very important issues, including humanitarian issues, but also speaking about trauma healing, education, addressing children, addressing issues connected with dialogue with international organizations, giving agency to Ukraine and Georgia in defining uh, how they want to be in this international group. So I think the session again uh, show us need for such dialogue because so many, we just touched on so many important issues which completely misunderstood in the United States, misunderstood among many organizations. And I think this opportunity, we, we will work hard to see if we can find some support for such working group and we can, and also I want to, in the, la, in the last minute, I want to um, stress your attention to the project with our school is doing that we have a, a peace lab on peace engineering and Kale put information about the survey that they will be want to do uh, or peace sense maker. So please, um, we'll be happy to everyone who is here to also share the information about and then help this peace lab to do research on that. So maybe one, we, I know the over time, but maybe one, two words from everyone, if you want to make some concluding remarks, I really don't want to deprive you of them. I will also say thank you. Thank you to our panelists for this really, really insightful conversations and everyone actually who joined uh, because this, this, this structural dimension of this conflict is there. And sometimes the people from Ukraine now, right now, and the, the Ukraine's problem gets sidelined. So this is very important to actually hear from, from the Ukraine and from Georgian experience as well, and see um, why, how this conflict, as Katy explained, is connected actually and it's broader. And as Ukrainians are saying many, many times that this, this war will exceed or it could exceed the territory of the Ukraine. And I think this Georgian experience speaks about it because in 2008, there was this discussion that this will exceed these territories and nobody really believed in, this, in that, that firmly. So we now sees, see what we, what we see recently. So I'm also uh, very hopeful that we will continue this this conversation and I'm very, very happy to see um, uh, Tatiana and uh, Olga that you are safe. Uh, and I'm very happy to see uh, Olga Filipova uh, again. I wanted to, to say this at the beginning. So many thanks from my side uh, as well. Maybe if it's possible very shortly regarding, regarding identity and regarding Russian language in this identity, which Putin used as a Weapon to to influence on Russia. Recently, probably a day ago, I found very interesting slogan which uh, Ukrainians developed now, particularly in Kharkiv, Russian speaking uh, Russian speaking uh, city. The slogan is, "I am not a Russian speaking population of Ukraine. I am Ukraine who knows perfectly language of our enemy." Yes, it's about identity and about influence, uh, using this Russian language uh, issue in Putin propaganda and uh, grounding his action to defend uh, Ukrainians who speak Russian. <clears throat> Tatiana, do you want to 
Yeah, uh, well, I just wanted to thank the people who organized this session. Perhaps for the next session, it would be interesting to have some Q&A uh, and some interaction with audience because we we don't know how our, our messages are received by people. It will be interesting to know. Otherwise, yeah, thank you so much. Um, Alicia, I will get you one if you want to like last two. Actually, no further comment, just uh, probably I would uh, really uh, conclude with um, my supportive words uh, towards the people and uh, government. And I mean, I, I think that this is the question where we all in Georgia stand united uh, to express uh, our solidarity and, and support. And this is really about us, uh, about Georgians and uh, about our fate. And uh, that is why we are so much nervously uh, watching uh, everything happening in Ukraine. I would probably only subscribe to what uh, Ketvan has just said. Uh, and uh, I really hope that uh, there will be some possibility to see uh, peace and uh, at least kind of ceased firing uh, in Ukraine and that we have a chance to meet in, in Ukraine, which is united and peaceful. Thank you. And we will continue this conversation. And Tatiana definitely will have more opportunities. But it was so important to let people know what you really think, because there is so much misunderstanding in the United States. And I'm really glad that we were able to hear voices from both countries. Thank you very much again, and we'll continue. We will be in touch and we'll continue doing what we can. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.